Hi y'all, Billy here. Welcome to the Messy Studio. If you watched part four of So You Want to Turn Pins, at the end I said in the next part I was going to make a pin. Well, this is it. It's a modified slim line using a specialized blank, or what I referred to in that episode as a specialized blank. This is stabilized cross-cut marble wood. It had some challenges and you'll see that here in a little bit. So keep watching if you want to see how this all turned out. This is part five of So You Want to Turn Pens. In it I thought I would show you the process that I use in making a pen. It's really not all that complicated. First thing you have to do obviously is decide what pen kit you want to use and you have to determine what blank you want to use. So I went through my blanks. Actually you can choose either one in, in either order. It really doesn't matter. So I went through my blanks and I showed you this piece of marble wood in episode four when we were talking about pen blanks. Makes a really pretty pen. This happens to be cross cut which means the grain runs this way. So it's cut across and you can see that's end grain there and there you see the side grain and there you see the end grain. Cross cut and cut on a bias where the grain would be running well the cut would be like this at basically a 45 degree angle to the grain makes some really pretty pins especially in a wood that's got different colors of grain running through it like this marble wood does. So, having chosen the blank, next thing I need to do is choose the right pin kit for it. Well, this is not a cheap blank and I believe it's been stabilized which just means it's been impregnated with resin. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose a blank, I mean a pin kit uh, particularly a plating that's fitting a blank of this nature. And in this case I'm going to use a slim line but I'm going to use a titanium slim line because if you remember from episode 3 when we were talking about kits I mentioned that my favorite platings were the harder platings like chrome, titanium, platinum. So all that said, we're going to use titanium. First thing you need to do is prepare the blank. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. What I do, what I like to do, let me get you in here a little bit closer. I like to look the blank over and figure out where my best points of interest are. And the most bland part of this blank looks to be this very end down here. So what I do is I line the tubes up. I give myself a, a little bit of room on the end. I put the tube here. I make a mark at the end of the tube. You can see the pencil mark right there. I take the other tube, in which case the slimline tubes are both the same size. So I'll take the other tube, move it to the, so that it's just touching the, the, the pencil mark. The pencil mark is actually roughly the same size as the kerf on my bandsaw. And I'll make another mark giving me about a sixteenth of an inch. You can see that mark there. I'll make another mark giving me about a sixteenth of an inch to work with. So I've got roughly a sixteenth of an inch on either side of, of the tube. Now, the other thing I do is you've got to have a way to keep this lined up. I'm really particular when it comes to grain orientation. <clears throat> you see how this makes a continuous flow? Here you can't tell so much, but here there's a continuous flow in the grain pattern on the other side the same way. I like that to look that way as best I can when I deliver it to the customer. So how do I do that? 
I'm going to take the most plain side of the blank, in which case right here. Here's my cut line. So I go just opposite my cut line. Here's the cut line. Just opposite the cut line. And I make... I'll draw a woodworker's triangle. Or a carpenter's triangle. So there's the carpenter's triangle. And there's the cut line. You see the cut line here, carpenter's triangle here. Now what that carpenter's triangle does is reminds me, once I get this cut apart, that these two pieces go together there. And I'll show you more about that as we go along. So now that I've got it marked, it's time to get it cut. So I take my mark, set it on the bandsaw sled. I like to use the bandsaw because I get as small as curve as possible. And you can see when it goes back together, you can barely tell there's been anything taken out of it. So now it's time to drill it out. But before we do that, I need to shorten this blank just a little bit so that it fits the other tube. So there's my carpenter's triangle. My grain alignment is like it should be. Let's go drill them out. Now for the slimline kit, it takes a seven millimeter bit. You can order these from the manufacturer of the pin kits or any of the pin kit manufacturers for that matter. Uh, this happens to be a brad point. I set it up with my calipers so I can show you another method as well. This is the seven millimeter brad point. The other one that you see right here is a letter J bit out of my set. And it mics the same. So either a seven millimeter bit or a J bit will do the job. You do not have to order all of these fancy size bits or specialty bits unless you just want to. Like I said in one of the previous episodes, I like to drill my blanks out on the lathe. If you do that, one of the things you're gonna need is a drill chuck. Now, yeah, <laughs> this is probably overkill. Uh, I got this from Little Machine Shop years ago because I got mad. I bought a chuck from one of the pen suppliers that was supposed to take bits up to a half inch. <clears throat> and many of the larger pen kits have sh shanks that are a half inch. The bit itself is bigger than that, but the shanks are a half inch. And the half inch didn't fit in anything over a half inch. I had one that was that didn't have a half inch shake and it was just over a half inch and it didn't fit. So I got mad and I ordered this from Little Machine Shop. It's uh yeah it's overkill but it does what I need it to do. If you're gonna drill on a lathe you need a chuck and you need the right jaws. Now they make specialized pin jaws that you can buy but if you've got a set of step jaws, you've got over an inch worth of grab there, and that's plenty. Actually, closer to an inch and a half. So I like to drill, I find my, I don't know if you can see it, I find my, triang my carpenter's triangle, and I will drill that in first. Set it in the, get it in the chuck, don't take it down into the depths of the jaws. Make sure you square it up. Test the run, that looks pretty good. This isn't perfectly square, which is why this isn't lining up the way I'd like it. Now, the first thing I want to do, even though I'm going to use for this first one, I'm going to use both bits that I showed you, the, I, the J and the 7 millimeter, just to show you that it works. First thing I'm going to do though is chuck up a center drill. I'm going to drill both of these with the center drill before I actually drill them because that ensures I actually have the center. You 
You don't want to drill too fast. This is 400, that ought to do about right. Bring it up. We'll use the seven millimeter first. Back it off every now and then to clear the shavings. You don't want to get this hot. Yeah, it's been stabilized. I can smell the resin. I just heard a disconcerting crack, did you? And we're through. Now, I hope that crack wasn't where I didn't want it. We'll have to see. It was almost through. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it cracked right there. It's a small split running about a half inch on both sides. And that's one of the reasons that I quit using the brad point. So I took the blank out and I filled the cracks with CA and I put it between the clamps. Uh, I don't know if you can see the crack. I barely can. So because that's had CA in it now, I want to redrill it. Just to make sure that the tube has clearance. You see a few shavings coming out of there. And you'll notice nice and centered on both sides. I got a nice straight through hole. Check the tube for fit. It goes in easily, falls out the other side. Just enough room for the glue to go all the way around. Now we'll drill the second one. Part of my carpenter's triangle here. That's centered. Tighten it down. Remember, I start with a center drill. Get the bit close and run it in. Back it up. Keep backing it out to clear the chips. That's one of the things that will overheat this bit. And when you overheat a bit, which I might have done on the last one, is one of the things that causes those blanks to crack, especially a really hard dense wood. 
an oily wood like cocobolo, teak, purple heart is really bad about heat. So is pink ivory. And synthetics. And this is resin impregnated, so you gotta be careful. We should be getting close. We should be really close. We're up to here. We've only got probably a few millimeters left. Yep, and there we go. No cracks. I didn't hear anything this time. Take it out and see how it looks. A little rough on the ends, but that's to be expected. That's not too bad at all. Check it with the tube. Tube goes in easy. Comes out the other side, no problem. Just right for the epoxy to hold. So now, let me put my bits and stuff away and, and just so you know, I just took this bit out. It's not hot, it's barely warm. That's what happens when you clean the chips regularly. Now the first thing you have to do before you can glue these tubes in is you gotta sand them up. A lot of people do this by hand, it doesn't take that long but I don't do it by hand. Let me show you. All you gotta do is give it some bite. Now the tubes have been roughed up, they've got some bite. Now to make sure they're nice and clean, I'm going to wipe them down with a little bit of lacquer thinner. That takes all the oil and sawdust off. Now we're ready to mix up some epoxy and start gluing. Let me find all my paraphernalia. For mixing my epoxy, I use stir sticks. These are wooden stir sticks, coffee stirrers, whatever you want to call them. You can use plastic ones too. I bought these at some dollar store. They were on clearance for like 50 cents a pack of, oh, two or three hundred. I bought four or five packs. I've still got enough to last me probably my lifetime. I like to use cards. This is something that one of my grandkids' toys came on. It was a special car from Racing Champions. I like to use cards to mix my epoxy trash. That way I get more use out of it and then I can throw it away. I will also use the card that came in the epoxy package. I'm also going to use the plastic thing from the back of the package. Doesn't take a whole lot. This is 5 minute epoxy. A lot of people like to use super glue. I don't. I don't think that you get a enough of a coat on the inside and I've also had problems with it sticking too early. Roll the tube. Get a good coating on it. Work it down into the blank. Get some glue down in there nice and good. Now, I'll find my 
this is the end I'm working on because there's my carpenter's triangle so that's the end I'm sticking it in first and I'll take some on the stick and spread it around inside the back part of the tube I mean of the blank now I'll put this in spin it down drag some of the epoxy up onto the tube itself this tube needs to be really really well coated spin it down in finish coating push it down using the stick so that it's flush pretty much with this end if it fills up on the inside down here, which it did, clean it out. The reamer will take care of the rest of that. And then set it aside to dry up. Carpenter's triangle is here. I'm going to start at that end. Roll my tube. Okay, it's actually been a little longer than a couple hours. It's the next day. <coughs> I've got the pin mill in my drill press, ready to go. The blanks are ready. It should be noted here that sometimes these are a bit aggressive for some pin blanks, in which case I will use this method what I have here is a pin mill that's been turned backwards with some sandpaper glued on it and I'll true the blanks up that way that's it's less aggressive it takes a little bit longer but you still get the same result and you don't have the chip out that you sometimes get using the other side of the mill so let's see what this looks like there's a little bit of epoxy in the tubes but this should clean that out if you don't feel comfortable holding this by hand, don't do it. You don't want to mill much. You just want to get it to where you see the shine of the brass tube. Like that. And you got the shine of the tube. Now I could put this in my vise. And that would probably be safer. That's really close. So we'll stop there. And I'll show you yet another method for squaring these up that is less aggressive than this. This is a transfer punch set. I got this from Harbor Freight over 10 years ago. If you have to take pins apart to fix them, which once in a while you might have to do, this is invaluable. This is what I use to take all my pins apart. You just find the right size center punch, knock them out, knock their appropriate parts out, and then that lets you put everything back together without damaging anything. Well, you can also do something else with these. Find the right size. that fits perfectly in the hole in this case it's this one
put it in a drill chuck. That's nice and square now, running to the I made this. This is a a platen from an old 12 inch uh, sander that I bought. I don't remember off a of Craigslist or something. The sander itself went bad. All that was available was this. I took the the metal part that mounted to the arbor off of it, made my own, screwed it to it. This is tapped for these threads. Run it up so that the uh, let me get you a little closer here. Run it up so that we're almost touching, not quite. Turn the lathe on, simply slide this down and sand it. If you have 80 or 100 grit sandpaper on here, it doesn't take all that long. And this is a pretty safe method for getting the job done. Nice and flush. That's just another way of doing it. Now let's get to turning. Remember my carpenter's triangle? After I get these turned, these marks will be gone. So I don't have any way of knowing what goes where. So what I will do right now is I will mark. Put those two together. I take a Sharpie. And I simply put a mark on the inside of the tubes. So the inside of these tubes are now colored in a couple of places and when I get through turning I'll know that the colored sides go together. That way I keep the integrity of my grain. I've mentioned before that I don't use a mandrel. I quit doing that years ago. I turn, I turn between centers. This is a dead center. This goes in the headstock. Clean that out. Don't want any trash in there. Same over here. This is a 60 degree live center. Take a second to look this over and see which I want on the top and which I want on the bottom. Doesn't really matter. It's a matter of personal preference, really. And I like to try to put the less prominent features up top where I can maybe not hide it with the clip, but cover it with a clip so it's you don't have to worry about losing nice figure. In this case, this will be my top blank. This will be my bottom blank. So let's turn the bottom first can buy bushings especially made for turning between centers <clears throat> I'm not going to make this into a regular slim line if I was going to use a regular slim line I would simply put the bushings in by regular slim line I mean that skinny pin I don't like skinny pins now I'll make one every now and then for customers that request one and I still make a few here and there, but out of this wood, I don't want to waste any more of this marble wood than I have to. This is my only piece. Like I said, it is stabilized. I could tell that from the smell. But you, you take your blank, put your bushings in it, put it between centers, and turn. Like I said, I'm going to do something a little bit different. That's my colored end. So that's going to be in the middle. I found a couple of washers that are 
a little bit bigger than the, the bushings, but the holes are perfect. And this washer will be at the center, which is where my marks are. I'll put this washer in here, and I'm actually going to turn this blank to that diameter. I'll turn it to this diameter down here, this diameter up here. And you'll see why in a minute. I call this my modified slim line. <laughs> Give me a smaller tool wrist. You can see it's a smaller tool wrist so I can get in there to it. It's going about 1240 RPMs. Blowing a few chunks out. Stabilized makes it harder. I don't know why I'm monkeying around with a small gab. <clears throat> Bigger is always better. So we're going, sharp tool, let's go. This stabilized marble wood is hard. Not only is it hard because it's stabilized, it's cross grain, and cross grain is always tricky. So I'm using the skew like a negative rake scraper. No chips. Still got some tear out there. Let's see what we can do. It's been my experience, regardless of what kind of blank you're dealing with, pretty much to take the corners down first. After you get it somewhat round, I should have started making that round a little sooner. I've got some chips I'm going to have to deal with, but we'll see. I didn't really intend to start this <laughs> little pin turning episode with a such a challenging blank, but I guess I'm glad I did. Gives you an idea of what you might run across and what you can do to take care of it. something. It doesn't matter if it's a pin or a spindle or a bow. 
if the tool starts having a hard time cutting, you lost your edge. Go sharpen it, let the tool do the work. You can see the difference in the kind of shavings I'm getting now too. Okay, now we'll do the other blank, looking for my marks. There's my center. A slightly bigger washer installed on this end over here. Hopefully I'll be able to avoid any more tear out than that. Knocking those edges down on a sander might have been a good idea. I didn't realize this was going to be this tough. But it'll be all right. I've still got some rough spots up here where there was some chip out. That's what's causing the bouncing. When I get down here, it's all nice and smooth. But the chip out's going away. See what the damage looks like. One little spot right there. The rest of it looks pretty good. Let me home. of this upper barrel. Better check it every now and then make sure I'm not generating too much heat because heat will make this crack.
think I like that shape. Got two little rough spots right there that I'm going to hit with super glue before I start sanding. Give that a while to cure and I'll be back. Alright, instead of just a couple hours, it's actually the next day. Been trying to heed my doctor's advice. If you've been following my channel, you'll know that I had back surgery on the 28th of December. And so I'm he said I could be out here doing small stuff as long as I took it easy and listened to my body. So that's what I've been trying to do. But I'm feeling good. So let's get this cleaned off and see if we can finish this pen. The CA has cured. So I'm just trying to get it down to a sandable finish for now. Get this excess CA out. Got a little bit of a ridge right there. But that won't be nothing. That should sand out. Okay, you might have noticed that I took the washer off the end of this. That's because with this upper barrel on my modified slim line, I like to create a little bit of a round. Let's sand this up. This is pretty smooth, but I'm still going to start at 180. Remember this is cross grain, so instead of sanding it this way, I'm sanding with the grain. Put a couple of grooves in it.
just gives it a classier look, I think. Now I gotta do the bottom barrel while I'm thinking about what kind of finish I want to put on this. Got the washer back in place because this one I don't want round. I want this edge crisp. sand. I don't really need to use the inertia sander because this is cross grain and I'm not going to have any sanding lines. That and this stuff is just so blasted hard. Two forty. I'm going to apply a couple of coats of Mylan's nit nitrocellulose sanding sealer. I like this stuff, it dries really quick. It's not cheap. But it dries really fast and it'll dry under friction. Hold the coat, that feels dry. I'm also going to apply some to the end. Just so it doesn't look unfinished. now to determine what kind of finish. I've mentioned before that I don't like CA as a finish. I've had bad luck with it. Not so much in applying it, but in how well it wears. Uh, granted, only one customer out of a couple of hundred has had an issue with their body chemistry and CA, but that's enough for me anyway. So my general go-to for finish on pens is lacquer. It wears well. I've not had any complaints from, with, from customers on it. Not had any come back. But I'm going to try 
product from General Finishes. This is called Wood Turner's Finish. It says to apply a thin coat. And then wait a half hour for subsequent coats. It does layer and it does build. The reason I'm not using lacquer on these is because it would take me over a week to finish the video because lacquer takes at least in this neck of the woods uh, lacquer takes a minimum of seven days up to ten days to really cure most finishes take a few days to really cure even though they're dry to the touch and I don't like assembling a lacquer pen even though I can touch it the next day I don't like doing that. I like waiting until it's fully cured to assemble it. That way the lacquer has reached its full hardness. I'm not big on friction polish on pins because it just doesn't last. And that's probably all I'm going to put on for now. The truth be told, I should probably put five or six coats on. But this stuff is so hard from the resin. And it was polished up nice, just to 400. I don't think it's going to wear badly at all, just as it stands. I could probably have gotten by with a friction polish, in fact. So after this dries up, I'll buff them off a little bit and then we'll put the pins together. And this is what it looks like all polished up. I forgot to turn the camera on. We'll put a little Renaissance wax on it. This is a microcrystalline wax. It also will layer and build. Give that a little bit of time to flash off and then polish it off. Let's see what happens. Yes, I use a cotton cloth. But I wasn't holding it wrapped around me or anything. If something happens, it jerks it out of my hand. could be better. I could be happier with it. And I would be happier with it if I did my lacquer dip method and I'll have a link to that video that I did in my autism awareness pins. <clears throat> You'll see that at the end of this video you can go look at it and see how I dip my pins. But I'm not going to do that with this one. 
I'm gonna let this renaissance I'm gonna let this renaissance wax harden up a little bit and we'll come back and put it together okay the parts are ready I'm moving you over to my small lathe because that's where the jigs I made for pressing my pins together are yes I use my lathe to put the pins together I've used the ratchet clamps I've used all kinds of things uh, I, I didn't want to spend money on a one-off item I've mentioned this before like a pen press has only has one use well I do the same thing with this let me show you what I'm talking about I, I made these out of oak and corian this is made to fit my tailstock spindle or quill and this is made to fit on my headstock spindle got all the parts ready to go it's pretty easy the slim line is one of the easiest kits you're going to do so you start the nib into the small end obviously get it so that it looks like it's lined up bring it up make sure everything is straight as you can if you set this if you start pushing this together and they're cocked you'll stretch that brass tube and you might even crack your blank don't ask me how I know this so constantly keep a vigil to make sure that this is going in straight and it doesn't take a whole lot of pressure and there you have it so what about the transmission you start it as well you see this line these transmissions are made so that if you seat this line to the end of the tube if you haven't shortened that tube or cut it too long from a longer tube and you can buy them in 10 inch lengths then you push that in it should be perfect well I don't gamble I test so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna test Again, keep it centered and straight. Taking it almost to the line. Insert the refill, screw it in, needs to go in just a little more. See I'm not quite to the line, so now I know what my distance is and what, I, what kind of tolerance I have and I know I can go a little bit farther. Take it right to the line this time. That's perfect. I get a nice withdrawal of the nib. It's in there about a sixteenth. Full extension. That's the way I like it. Now I made this modified so we're not going to use the sitter band. I'll put that aside and maybe use it for something else later. Put the end cap into the pocket clip. Find where I want the clip to be that looks good right there give myself some working room the quill on this Nova is just a little short for my liking but other than that I've been real happy with it push it in make sure you get a good squeeze nice and tight press the pin together now most people would stop right there well I'm kind of picky remember I've said at the start of this I like grain alignment a lot so how do I know what's what 
Well, it looks close where it is. But if you notice, this is side grain, and the grain structure on this edge of the side, or the grain structure over here on this side of the blank, the grain's going that way. You've got some upturn over here, and you've got some downturn there. Go to the other side, and you can see a little more clearly. This has an arc slightly this way. This arc is slightly this way. So that means I'm... means I'm out. So how do you fix that? Well it's easy, you just turn it. And now everything is going the same way. Grain is aligned. Pin is out. Pin is in. Some people put them together so that the grain aligns when the pin is fully extended. I do it just the opposite. I, I align it so that the grain is aligned while the pin is recessed and I think it shows better that way again that's my opinion that's the way I do things and that's how you make a pin a wooden pin actually this is a specialty blank this isn't a wooden pin this is a specialty blank it was stabilized I think in the next couple of days I'll do another one and make another video on those. I don't know. I'm going to use. I don't know if I'm going to use regular wood or synthetic. I'll probably go with synthetic first, and then I'll do a regular wood, and we can let it sit up and wait on the finish. So there you have it. A pin. A modified slimline. I could be happier with it. I probably won't sell this one. I'll give it away. I, there's some birthdays or anniversaries or something coming up. But it's pretty. It's nice. It's got a kind of a satin sheen to it. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people don't like high gloss. Some people do. But it doesn't just look like your regular skinny old slim line and you're not paying the extra dollars for the comfort pin. Which is basically just uses bigger bushings up here which is I did the same thing using two different outside diameter quarter inch washers you can too so thanks for watching I hope this helps you on your pin turning quest uh, I gotta tell you it's very very addictive You'll find yourself spending more money than you thought you would if you really get into it and you like it. Especially if you start selling and getting orders like I've done for years. So, please like and subscribe. Come back and see what I do next. Thanks for watching, y'all.